All right, my friends, we're back to the inverted yield curve, uh, recessionary warnings, inverted yield curve. In fact, I was reading a, uh, a blog post yesterday that said the inverted yield curve predicts, it was a comment on a uh, blog post actually, but the inverted yield curve predicts all of the recessions. I'm like, we just were through this like six months ago. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. Uh, you got to change your game here. If the reverting yield curve predicts all these recessions, what were we back in freaking January? Uh, that's uh, Literally, did you know if you eat carrots, you're going to predict a recession? Eating carrots predicts a recession. How do we know this? Because if you eat carrots, certainly a recession will come. And thus, if you eat carrots, not only will you die, but you're going to have a recession. Inherently, it was guaranteed. Eat carrots and you will have a recession. Thus, the correlation is so high. I, I just, this is nuts. I, I, I get so frustrated. I, I know what's going on here. I mean, I just, I get it. It's the, I just, and I say this, I'll say it to him, boo in the face. Unfortunately, it's, it works. The fear drives clicks. It's just, there's no other way around that. Because how else could you sit there and say, Again and again and again, the inverted yield curve. Uh, it's the same thing with a climate change hysteria. The Greenland, Greenland, Greenland. Then we're gonna uh, stop that. And they say July is the hottest. Uh, then we're gonna stop that. We're gonna when Greenland gets its uh, ice back again, we'll forget about Greenland. It's just it's these little cherry picking things to get you scared. It's uh, it, it's 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 sad. I mean, no other way around it. It's sad because you're sitting there thinking. All right, so Greenland was yesterday's news because now Greenland is back to normal temperatures and the ice cap is boiling back up, or boiling, not the right word, freezing back up. So we're going to add billions of tons more of ice and snow uh, which to replace what was melted because this is, a, this is literally climate change. This is what happens. Inverted yield curve. Well, it didn't happen back then, but there was a Trump tariff stuff. Well, it didn't happen then, and so now we're back to inverted yield curve. Do you see what happens? The level of control these people have on you? Um, I was reading a listen to a podcast, Bob Murphy Show. It's actually interesting. He's an uh, economist. Uh, I think he's at Texas Tech. I can't remember. But anyway, he's got his PhD in econ economics from uh, NYU in 2003. And he uh, he's, uh, a, he's with the Mises Institute, Louis von Mises. So Mises.org where I got my Austrian Revolution shirt. And he was talking, it was actually pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm going to PT, by the way. Um, and, and by the way, for all of you who say, don't drive and, and vlog or whatever, I'm, I'm not staring at the camera, I'm looking around. I mean, this is what I do, I look. I don't know, it's like, if you learn this in the military or what, but I'm always keeping my head on a swivel when I'm driving. So I just look at the camera on occasion, but certainly not staring at it. So I, I'd watch, uh, I, I initially said I was gonna stop doing vlogging or whatever this is, posting. When, uh, when I was driving, and uh, someone had pointed out something about the wrist. And then uh, I was watching uh, my man Jason over at Engineering Explained, and he had his uh, uh, taken his Tesla for a ride uh, from, I think it was like Seattle to, I don't know, South Dakota or something like that, Chicago. I can't, I can't remember what the whole point was. Uh, but he was vlogging in his car while he was doing that. And I said, you know, uh, it's actually not, this is not any more dangerous than just driving. I'm still, I look at the camera once in a while, but not like I'm checking a text or something. Still looking around like I normally do. So I appreciate the fear for your old buddy, Josh, but uh, uh, going to physical therapy and I got something to say, I'm gonna say it. I just did a, a blog post actually, which I which I sent on my, uh, I haven't sent to my email subscribers yet. Cause I can only do that once every 24 hours. Uh, talk about my position of the permanent portfolio, my uh, take on Harry Brown's permanent portfolio. Uh, the point was that got me thinking about something I want to say here about recessions and whatnot. All right. So, because I'm listening to my man Bob Murphy, who's the uh, uh, economics econ economist uh, with the Mises. I, I don't know who he works for, Texas Tech, I think, but. Uh, he has the Bob Murphy show uh, on Austrian uh, economics. And uh, his take, yes, it was actually incredibly interesting. He was talking about uh, they live or something like that with Rowdy Roddy Piper. It was, man, it was, look, I've never seen the video. I remember Rowdy Roddy when I was a kid. And I got my first cable when I was in like, eighth grade. 
and uh, watching, man, I love professional wrestling. I loved it back then. And Rowdy Roddy, Jimmy Superfly, Snuka, you know, obviously Andre the Giant. We had Sergeant Slaughter. What was that name? Sergeant Slaughter, who I couldn't stand because I always, look, man, I was born and raised to be a, uh, to think America was a bad guy. So anyone who's waving flags and being all patriotic, that, that was not my cup of tea. I was the exact opposite. Uh, the Iranian Sheik, remember him? Oh, it was just fun. It was a little kid. You never had access to TV, and all of a sudden you got cable. And you're like, it was, it was, it was my brother. And I would just watch that. It was like we'd, I mean, it's like it was must see TV for us. That was a lot of fun. So, anyway, Rowdy Roddy, I, I couldn't stand him because he was always rowdy. <laughs> but apparently, he had a movie. I didn't know this. And uh, and my man Bob Murphy was talking about the movie They Live. It's just a, you know, a pre-take on the red pill kind of thing where you have these glasses on and you see everyone's aliens and their propaganda trying to lead you to various things. It's interesting. But at, at what, but what Bob was saying, now remember, um, Austrian economics are, uh, are ANCAPs, all right? That's anarchist capitalist. And a lot of people hear this term anarchist and they get, oh, they think Bolsheviks. And it's not like that, unfortunately. They've taken over the term like the left has taken over the term liberal. Um, you know, now we got to say classical liberalism, uh, the old Adam Smith way and, you know, monetarism in terms of Milton Friedman way. But then you got Austrian, which is anarchism, but it's, an it's ANCAP or volunteerism as my man Jack Spurko over the uh, survivor po survival podcast would say volunteerism. I like that. But ANCAP, I kind of like that. It's a little bit easier to say. I'm an anarcho-capitalist, which means do whatever the hell you want. Just don't hurt anyone. It's literally that simple. Trade however you want. You're a big boy. You can decide for your own without the government intervention. So what Bob was saying, though, is interesting. And trust me, this goes back to the whole thing of recessions. When the Federal Reserve Board came around in, what, 1913, all right, the whole point was to uh, arrest the, the depressions and recessions that we had in the 1870s and I think 1905 or something like that. That was the whole point. Right? Give, and Woodrow Wilson uh, came along, again, another guy just big on, on making it dominant by the federal authority uh, and take away your freedom to eliminate the business cycle. So we hear eliminate the business cycle all the time <clears throat> from the left. Uh, because that's their whole thing about socialism is that we're going to uh, keep the business cycle, keep the wolves at bay, essentially, with, with getting rid of the business cycle. And unfortunately, uh, they get rid of the business cycle by chopping off the heads of those who succeed or anyone who can succeed. And thus, we're all poor, equally misery, miserable. That's socialism uh, part and parcel. The business cycle, though, is interesting. So in the late 1800s, there are some pretty significant recessions. Now, whatever you can attribute it to, I'll let you do your research on that. So we're going to stop that with the Federal Reserve Board. All right, then lo and behold, we have the Great Depression of the 1930s. Federal Reserve Board didn't see that. Now, Milton Friedman would say uh, in the monetarist, well, that was because uh, they contracted the money supply in the late 20s uh, during a, a time of trade uh, being slowing down, uh, economy slowing down. They contracted the monetary supply. They actually literally reduced the dollars that were in the, uh, the, the in currency. Uh, and because of that, it literally led to the depression uh, because as you inherently you reduce the dollars, you inherently are deflating the currency, not inflating it. Inflating it is you put more dollars out there, deflating is you take dollars away. So you're contracting the currency uh, at a time when trade was, uh, was being contracted uh, anyway. Uh, now that's, that's, I think that's actually right on take. But the Federal Reserve didn't stop that, the business cycle, right? They did not stop the Great Depression from happening, even though that was their whole intent was to stop the business cycle uh, to, to basically moderate uh, the ups and downs of the economy. And they didn't do that. The first, you know, they were 20 years in and they screwed up, royally screwed up. All right, so then we go back to 1966 and 1982. Well, the Federal Reserve didn't do that either. I mean, the economy was a freaking basket case, and you can blame whatever you want, but the simple facts were we had huge inflation, runaway inflation. So they did the exact opposite of what they did in the 1920s and 30s. They didn't contract the monetary supply. They increased it significantly to the extent that we had huge inflation. And that really, if you retired in 1966, you're in a world of hurt, man. No other way around that. And then I would add to that, you know, Nixon, one of the worst presidents we've ever had with his uh, expansion of government bureaucracy and his Keynesian, he says, we're all Keynesian now, i.e. Uh, power through the government will, will help uh, eliminate the business cycle, business markets, and will get people uh, a little bit more stable. 
All right, so the, the Fed didn't fix that. Fed didn't fix the Great Depression. On top of that, then we had the Great Recession of 2007, uh, well, actually six, seven, and then into eight, obviously. The Fed didn't fix that either. So we've had significant business cycles that the Fed hasn't fixed. On top of that, we have a recession essentially every five years. So what exactly has the Fed done? What exactly has the Fed done? Well, they could say, well, we've moderated the recessions, have we? Uh, I don't know, I guess you could say that. Have they moderated the, the chaos of the Great Recession on top of the Great Depression, on top of the, the insanity of 1966 through 1982? No, no. So what exactly has the Fed done? Well, here's Bob Murphy's take, and I actually somewhat subscribe to this. And this goes back to my whole thing with this inverted yield curve and all the fear that's out there. What would happen if everyone in the U.S. said life is pretty good? What would happen in terms of your ability to rely on the government to fix things? Your ability to blame that guy, to blame Trump or blame Obama, to blame the black guy, blame the white guy, blame the immigrants, blame, blame, blame. What would happen if you said, you know something, things are pretty good? Is there some kind of, not even a conspiratorial thing, it's kind of like just by design, people who go into government work. Now, I'm not saying the, the laborer at the freaking, the guy who's pushing the papers from point A to point B at the DOD or anything, but the heads that go into these apparatuses with their PhDs from the Harvard London School of Economics and Kennedy School, Kennedy School in Harvard. Is there some mechanism they're trained to gather power, right? And the way they gather power is keeping you in fear. How do they keep you in fear? They make it seem like if it wasn't for the government, the wolves would be at the door. It's always one step away. You're one paycheck away from going bankrupt, one paycheck away from being on the welfare line, the food line. And the one entity that can help solve that would be the government, the Federal Reserve Board, monetary policy, whatever you want to say. Because the history of the Federal Reserve Board certainly, certainly is not one of, uh, of high standing. It's not. I mean, they just have not done what their task has been. I can see, here's some economists saying, oh, the recessions have been uh, muted to some degree. Well, maybe the recessions have to some degree. They're still there. Don't get me wrong. They're still there. Maybe not to the extent they used to be. But the big ones haven't been. I mean, you cannot argue that the big ones that happen every generation, there has been a huge recession, huge recession every generation. So maybe the recessions, the, the, as we know them on a regular basis that we had back in the, uh, before the Federal Reserve took over, maybe those have been moderated, right? But the huge, you know, in terms of a regular recessionary business cycle, maybe that's been moderated. But instead of that, we get huge recessions instead, bordering on depressions. Which would you rather have? A five-year business cycle where you know, you know, business flows and then it stops a little bit? Or a, or, or a fake fiat uh, uh, propaga uh, not propaga propagation you know, where they, keep, they hold it up on their fiat stuff, basically fake you know, the currency manipulation, whatnot, and then every you know, 20 years or so, kaboom, you get hammered. Which would you rather have? And the point though is, what are they trying to do? Why, what are they trying to do? Because the Federal Reserve certainly has not been proven to be a successful entity to keep the wolves at bay once a generation. They're not. So what's the whole point about all this recessionary doomsday talk on climate change, on the stock market, on recession, on unemployment, all this talk and if you want to say Trump on immigration too, I look, man, I'm all for immigration. I just think you got to police up the border so you know who's coming here. I got no problem with that. I think Trump would agree with that. We need to know who's coming to America. That is not anti-immigrant. It's not. We get a right to know who's coming here without question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the idea that that's even controversial is nuts, man. But anyway, so we have these huge declines in economic activity. And we have these continual fear mongering uh, all the time about climate change, about recession, about business cycles, about the inequality of the wealth, uh, just all this stuff. And I'm, I'm at to the point now as a 49 year old man, and I look, I'm a cynical guy to begin with, I get that, but I'm, I'm, I've come to the conclusion it's all by grand design. 
they focus on that to keep you fearful because a fearful population is easier led. Just look what George Orwell said, for heaven's sake. I can't read it or quote you verbatim here, but just look at what George Orwell said about socialism. It's nuts. It's George Orwell, a socialist in of itself. And you think about this, you're like, a fearful population is one that can be manipulated and led. A population that's content can't be so much. So a population that says, you know, I did a survey of, of all these retirees out there in the U.S. and 80% of them are comfortable. Hmm. So if 80% of the retirees are comfortable, why is there a retirement crisis? But we got to manufacture this retirement crisis. We got to manufacture this recessionary crisis. Crisis. We got to manufacture this climate change crisis. We got to manufacture this uh, trade crisis. We got to manufacture this immigration crisis. 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 This food crisis. This population crisis. We got to manufacture this to keep people scared. And when people are scared, they they turn over their powers to the government. Sad man, and uh, and I actually think there's a lot of validity in that argument. And again, I don't know, it's not conspiratorial, like they're all getting around the was it Blindenbergs, whatever those people are called. I don't even know what they're called. The Rothschilds, I don't know what they're called. They're not gathering in some Mr. Burns uh, Republican Party headquarters. Remember, we had Vampire, he had Rush Limbaugh, Mr. Burns, he had uh, <laughs> the, I think the guy from Star Trek, the evil, evil guy from Star Trek, Dr. Hibbard was there, you know. <laughs> They're not gather around like that to have some conspiracy. They're just, they're trained in this regard to keep people in fear so they can be led because the government will be there to solve your problems. Something to think about, something to think about. So the Austrian School of Economics, there's no real school for that, but Mises, Ludwig von Mises, the Mises Institute um, is a good place to start. Uh, my man, Bob Murphy's got a book was economics uh, lessons for the young economist uh, is out there. I think you can actually get the PDF for free from the Mises.org. So, all right, we'll see you next time. Let me take care of some PT and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Tom.